Okay, so now we're going to go through paper two, which is a multiple choice extended option for biology. That's IGCSE from Cambridge International Examination, CIE, from October, November 2018, variant two, so 0610-22. All right, let's begin. You ready? No. Yes, yes, yes. Question one. A person drinks a glass of iced water and the volume of sweat they secrete decreases. This is an example of which characteristic of living organisms. So they're really hot, they drink a nice cool glass of ice water, and they cool down so they don't sweat as much. Is that an example of growth? No, they're not getting bigger because of it. They're not, it's not an example of movement, although they have to use movement in order to drink the water. That's not an example. Respiration? Nope, they're not. Yes, they are doing respiration. They're living, but that's not, this isn't, ex this isn't an example of respiration. Sensitivity? Yes, they're responding to their environmental change, which is they've drunk the ice water, so they're cooler. There we go. The answer is D. Question two. Lichens are formed from two different organisms living together. The table shows some of the characteristics of two, or of two organisms, X and Y, found in most lichens. So X, made of strands called hyphae, and hyphae have cell walls and many nuclei. So which kingdoms are represented by X and Y? X. Is that a fungus or a protoctist? Well, hyphae, cell walls of many nuclei, those are fungi. Okay, why? It's single celled, it the cell contains a nucleus and, a chloropl and chloroplasts. So plants, they contain nucleus and chloroplasts, but they're, gen they're not single celled. Protoctists, yes, they're single celled and they contain a nucleus and chloroplasts. Fungus, nope, those are as described as an X. And plants, again, it's not a plant. So the answer is B. Question three, two types of cell, one animal and one plant were examined using a light microscope. Which row shows the correct combination of cellular features that would be observed in the cells? Okay, so what do you see under the microscope? So in an animal cell, can you see chloroplasts? No. Uh, if we look at the other answers here, membranes, cytoplasm, nucleus, membranes, cell walls, you also can't see cell walls or chloroplasts here. So it looks like the answer has to be B because you can't see chlor chloroplasts, cell walls, or chloroplasts in animal cells. Okay, so let's look at plant cells. Can you see a chloroplast in plant cells? Yes. Can you see a membrane in plant cells? Yes. Can you see cytoplasm in an, an animal cell? Well, you actually can. It's it kind of looks slightly, a, a slightly different, looks slightly different than just the, the blank space in between the cells. Can you see the nucleus? Absolutely, yes. So the answer is B. Question four. The diagram shows part of a leaf in cross section. Structures X and Y are both part of the same what? Okay, structure X, that is a palisade mesophyll cell. And structure, uh, structure Y, that is a guard cell. So are they part of the same cell? No, they're different cells. Are they part of the same organ? Well, yeah, they're both part of the leaf. A leaf is an organ, so I'd say that looks like a good answer. Part of a the same tissue? No, nope. well, we have palisade tissue. We have the epidermal tissue, so no, it's not part of the same tissue. Part of the same vessel? No, it, uh, that would be the, the xylem or the phloem, so it's not that. So the answer is B. Question five, how do carbon dioxide and oxygen move into and out of a mesophyll cell? So do they move into and out by active transport? No, it's, it's passive. Is it by diffusion? Yes, they just diffuse in and out. You don't need a membrane to diffuse. You can have a membrane, but you don't need it. Respiration, nope, that's how they're produced sometimes. Um, transpiration? No, that's just water. So the answer is B. Question six. The diagram shows a plant cell after it, is, after it has been submerged in a solution, P, for 20 minutes. Which row describes the water potential of solution P and the con condition of the cell? Okay, so what you see here is, is a condition called plasmolysis. And so that means the cell membrane is pulled away from the cell wall. It's still attached in a few sections, but that is a cell membrane. Okay, the cell wall is, the, is around the outside. It doesn't really change shape very much. And so that's because the water has moved out of the cell. 
and that's the reason why the water moves out is because there was there there was more water water potential inside the cell than there was outside of the cell so that means this it has to go from high water potential to low water potential so this has to have low water potential okay so water potential of solution p so it has to be low is it higher than the cell sap in the vacu vacuole no it's lower than the cell sap in the vacuole. It's certainly not going to be the same, or else there'd be no movement of water either way. So it looks like the answer is C, but let's let's look look at this. So is the condition of the cell plasmalized? Yes, it's plasmalized. Is it turgid? No. High turgid pressure? No. Uh, low turgid pressure? Well, yes, it is low turgid pressure, and it's flaccid. Flaccid means it's just limp and there's nothing holding it in place. So the answer here is C. And it's flaccid because it has a low turgid pressure, but it's certainly not the, the, the cell sap, is the water potentials aren't the same. So the answer is C. Question seven, the data, the data show concentrations of sugar and starch in an onion. Okay, so we have the total sugar, including reducing sugar in grams per 100 grams is 3.7, and the starch in grams per 100 grams is zero. So there's no starch and there's some reducing sugar. The onion is tested with Benedict's solution and iodine solution. Which set of results is correct? Okay, so Benedict's, that is for reducing sugar. And it turns from, from blue to a variety of different colors. And the final color can be brick red. Okay, an iodine solution, that's from that's starch. And it, do, it goes from... Uh, a brownish yellow color to a blue black color. Okay, so uh, if there is reducing sugar present, it will the the result will be brick red. The end color will be brick red. Iodine solution, there is no starch in it, so it's going to be brown. So the answer here is D. Question eight: The base sequence of part of one strand of a DNA molecule is shown. A, T, G, C, and C. What is the base sequence of the other strand? Okay, so we have to figure out which, which uh, bases are complementary. So A matches with T. G matches with C. Okay, so we look at this. This will be T. This will be A. This will be T. This will be C. This will be G. This will be G. And the answer here, so we look at these, it's T, A, T, C, G, G. So the answer is C. That's the one that matches up. Question nine. The apparatus shown is used for an experiment on starch digestion. Which test tube contains the most sugar after 20 minutes? Question nine. The apparatus shown is used for an experiment on starch digestion. Which test tube contains the most sugar after 20 minutes? Okay, so test tubes A and D both contain starch and salivary amylase. So the enzyme that breaks down starch that's found in your saliva. B and C both contain just plain starch. Okay, so which test tube contains the most sugar after 20 minutes? Well, it's certainly not B or C. And the reason why is there's nothing to break the starch down into sugar. It ha the am that's what amylase does. That's the purpose of amylase is to break the starch down into sugar. Okay, now is it going to break it down faster at 15 degrees Celsius or at 37 degrees Celsius? Well, at salivary amylase, the optimum temperature is going to be closest to body temperature, which is 37 degrees Celsius. So the answer is D. Question 10. The graph shows the effect of temperature on the action of an enzyme. Well, pretty much any enzyme will have the same graph. We'll have our enzyme activity up the y-axis, temperature in deg degrees Celsius at the bottom. This will be our optimum temperature. Well, maybe a little bit over the optimum temperature, this will be slow reactions because colder. This will be denaturing of enzymes. Okay, so why does the rate of reaction change when the temperature is increased from 20 degrees Celsius? So from 20 degrees Celsius to 30 degrees Celsius. So what happens in this section of the graph? Is it because there's more kinetic energy of particles? Well, yes, the kinetic energy is increased, so the rate of reaction will be increased. There's and more frequent collisions of particles? Yes, that, that 
happens because the energies are moving, the, the particles are moving faster, so they'll be colliding more often. So the answer is A. Question 11. An experiment was carried out using the apparatus shown. The carbon dioxide content of the water in each test tube was measured at the start and again three hours later. In which test tube would there be a decrease in carbon dioxide content? Okay, so remember, photosynthesis. That decreases carbon dioxide. Aerobic respiration. So respiration increases carbon dioxide. Okay, so which one would be there be the most photosynthesis is what they're asking. So in which test would there be a decrease in the in carbon dioxide content? Okay, so carbon dioxide, well photosynthesis happens with light, photo meaning light. So it's certainly not going to be the ones where there's black polythene to keep out light. So it's not going to be A or B because you need the, the photosynthesis. Now, which is going to be doing the photosynthesis? Is it going to be the plant or the snail? Well, both of them do respiration, but the plant is the only one that does photosynthesis. So the answer is C. Question 12. The diagram shows the structure of cells from the leaf of a plant. Okay, what type of cells are they? Well, these are lined up nice and neat end to end to form a nice neat barrier on either side of the leaf. Those are epidermal cells. So the answer is A. Guard cells, well, they look a little bit, well, I'm not drawing them very well. They're more paired. There's a gap in between them. There's a pair of them with a gap in between them. So it's not those. The, and the gap is for gases to diffuse in and out of the plant, including the water vapor. Palisade cells, it's not those because those, yes, they're lined up nice and neat, but they're lined up vertically rather than horizontally. Okay like that. And spongy cells, well those, there's a lot more variation, they're more circular, and there's gaps in between them so that there can be air spaces, so it's not spongy cells. So the answer here is A. Question 13. What is the result of a diet lacking in iron? Is it bleeding gums? No, that, that sounds like scurvy, which is vitamin C. Poor wound healing, that could also be scurvy, which is vitamin, lack of vitamin C. Is it reduced number of red blood cells? Yes, it sounds like that answer because um, the iron is needed to make up the red blood cells to, for the hemoglobin. Is it weak bones and teeth? No, that sounds like lack of calcium, vitamin D. So it's not, it's not D. So the answer here is C. Question 14. Which row shows an enzyme with the correct site of production and products? Okay, amylase. Okay, is amylase in the, in the salivary glands? Yes, that looks good. But, and the products, amino acid? No, they produce the, the sugars. Amino acids are from proteins. Amylase, is that in the stomach? Nope, it's in the small intestines and the salivary glands. And does it, break, does it break down into sugar? Yes. So it's not B, it's not A. Protease, is that in the salivary glands? Nope. That's in the stomach and small intestines, and it breaks down into amino acids, not sugar. So it's not that one. Protease, stomach, yep. And it breaks down into amino acids? Yes. So the answer here is D. Question 15. The diagram shows a plant cell. What type of plant cell is this? Okay, so it's one cell with a really long extension to increase the surface area for absorption of water and minerals, that would be a root hair cell. Not the root cortex cell, those are part of the root that make up the bulk of it. Uh, mesophyll cells, those are in the leaf. Guard cells are in the leaf, so it's, the answer is the root hair cell. 16. Roots and leaves both act as a source and a sink for sucrose and amino acids at different times during the year. At which point in the year are the roots most active as a source? So the time that the, that the roots are most active as a source is a time when there's really no photosynthesis happening. Photosynthesis will be producing sugars. So, the, uh, so if there's photosynthesis, the roots are not a very good source. So it might be storing sugars for the next year. Okay, so when, when is there very little photosynthesis? Is it the spring? Yeah, that looks like that because in the springtime, there's 
not there's no leaves they're trying they need to start they need to get some energy to grow new leaves is, is it summer no that's the time when you're going to have the most photosynthesis is the is it the autumn nope that's when they're storing they're, the, that is when the roots are most active as a sink so it's not that is it the winter well there's not really much happening in the winter is there the plants become fairly dormant they're not a source or a sink so plants need the roots in the springtime to provide energy so that they can grow new leaves. So that's the, the best time for them to be a source. Question 17. The diagram shows a circulatory system. Yeah, so a double circulatory system, one of, one of ours, not a fish. Which vessels carry oxygenated blood? Okay, so we have the heart. It go, the, the blood goes from the heart to the lungs. Why does it go from the heart to the lungs? because it doesn't have oxygen, so it's not there. It comes from the lungs to the heart. Yes, there will be oxygen, a lot of oxygen at that point. And then it goes from the heart to the body, carrying the oxygen. And once it's in the, in the body, in the capillaries, it uses up the oxygen, it goes into the tissues and organs. So it uses up the oxygen, it goes back to the heart so that it can get more oxygen. It's not there. So the answer is two and four. The answer here is D. Question 18. What happens to the heart valves when ventricles contract? Okay, so let's draw our heart. So we have a heart, a nice pretty heart. We divide it into four chambers. We have vessels going in. Then we have vessels going out. All right, so this is the way that I draw a heart simply when I'm on it, when I'm doing an exam. Okay, so blood goes in here, goes down, goes up, and through here, we have a valve. Okay, again, we have a valve here, goes down through here, it goes, it goes back up. So these are the atria on e either side. These are the ventricles on either side. Okay. So this in between, that's an atrioventricular valve, the a AV valve. Okay, so what happens to the heart valves when the ventricles contract? So when the ventricles contract, the reason why is because it's trying to push blood up and out, either to the body or to the lungs. Okay, so that means the AV valves have to close. So the atrioventricular valve closes. The semilunar valves, the ones inside these two blood vessels, these are the semilunar, semilunar valves. Those have to open because that's where the blood's going through. Okay, so those have to open. The answer here is B. Question 19. The diagram with the structure labeled X shows a bacterium with proteins on its surface. The diagram labeled Y shows proteins made by the human body. Okay, so th these are the, this is a pathogen, this is a bacterium, and these are the things on, the X is the things on the surface that identify it as a pathogen. Y are the things produced by the human body that identify the, pa the pathogen. So basically, Y has to fit onto X. So which row shows the correct combination for destroying the bacterium? Okay, so will this fit, will this fit onto here? No, they're kind of, they're opposite. You want something that will fit like that. So it has to be that one. So if we looked at that, the correct shape, it has to be one of these two. Okay, because those two don't make sense. Now, on the name of X, is this, is that an antigen or an antibody? It's an antigen. And our human body makes the antibodies. So A, the answer is A. Question 20, the graph cho shows changes in the volume of air in the lungs of a person at rest over a period of 30 seconds. Which graph shows the changes in the volume of air in the lungs of the same person immediately after they have done five minutes of vigorous exercise? So you're resting, you're not breathing very deeply or, or very, very quickly. You do vigorous exercise, you're breathing more quickly and you're breathing deeper. So which one of these graphs shows that? 
Okay, so it's not A, that looks pretty much exactly the same. B, they're breathing much more deeply, but they're breathing more slowly. And after you've exercised, you're generally breathing quite quickly. C, they're definitely breathing more deeply, because that is, that's on the y-axis. They're breathing more quickly because, if you look at this, in 30 seconds, they're going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight breaths. And in this one, in 30 seconds, they're going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 breaths. So they're breathing more quickly. So that looks like an answer. I'm going to circle that one. D, in 30 seconds, they're going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight breaths. So they're still, they're going the same rate, they're going deeper, but the same rate. So the answer is C, they're, they're breathing more quickly and they're breathing more deeply. Question 21. As we breathe out, something is something through the lungs. Which words correctly complete gaps one and two? So, is it carbon dioxide or oxygen is excreted or respired through the lungs? Is, well, first of all, do you get respiration through the lungs? We get respiration in the cells of the lungs. We don't get respiration it through the, the, the lungs. So something is excreted from the lungs. And what do we excrete? Do we excrete oxygen? Uh-uh, no, we like to keep our oxygen. We excrete carbon dioxide, so the answer here is A. Question 22. A person carries out vigorous exercise without drinking any water. Uh -huh. Silly, silly. What would happen to the concentration and volume of the person's urine immediately after exercise? Well, clearly they're using up a lot of water because they're probably sweating a lot. So the urine concentration, will it will get stronger. There'll be, there'll be less water in the urine, so it will increase. Urine volume, it will become, you'll have less volume because, so it'll decrease because a lot of the water will have, you'll be sweating it out. So the answer is C. Question 23. What does the central nervous system consist of? We have the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. So brain, spinal cords, and peripheral nerves. No, peripheral nerves are part of the peripheral nervous system. So no, the brain and spinal cord only. That looks like a good answer. Brain only? No, you also have the spinal cord and the central nervous system. The spinal cord and peripheral nerves, again, peripheral nerves are part of the periphery, peripheral nervous system, so the answer is B. Question 24. A student used two seedlings, X and Y, to investigate phototropism. The diagram shows their investigation. So what you'd expect with phototropism is obviously the seedling should bend towards the light. So if at, at the start of the experiment for X, piece of glass was put in at the very beginning. Nothing happens because it's the very beginning. The light is coming from the right hand side. But over time, the piece of glass was on the left hand side and the light was on the right hand side. There's no curvature towards the light. And experiment Y, they put the piece of glass on the other side. Again, at the very beginning of the experiment, nothing happened because it's the very beginning. And over time, the plant, the seedling, curves towards the light, even though there's a piece of glass in the side. So which statement explained the difference, explains the differences in results between X and Y? Okay, so what's happening? The difference between the two experiments is that something is, is being produced at the tip and traveling down the, the side of the plant. As it's traveling down, it's being broken down by the light on the side closest to the light but it's blocked by the piece of glass. It can't go past that piece of glass on, on in X, but in Y there's nothing to stop it, so it causes the elongation of the cells in Y. So which statement explains the difference in results between X and Y? So A, the piece of glass destroyed the oxen on the shaded side of the seedling. No, it doesn't destroy it. The piece of glass destroyed the oxen on the side of the seed, seedling facing the light. It didn't destroy it. Glass doesn't really react with anything. The piece of glass in X stopped the oxen traveling down the shaded side of the ceiling. That looks like the correct answer to me. And the piece of glass in X stopped the oxen traveling down the side of the ceiling facing the light. Well, if it stopped it traveling down the side of the light, then that would mean if the piece of glass is on, on the side of the light, it stopped it traveling down that side, nothing would have happened in experiment Y. So the answer is definitely C. Question 25. 
What is a response to a low concentration of glucose in the blood? Okay, glucagon will cause the body to convert glucose into glycogen. Nope, glucose into glycogen, that is done by insulin. Okay, glucagon will cause the body to convert gly glycogen to glucose. Yep, that looks like the correct answer. Insulin will cause the body to convert glucose into glycogen. Uh, so you have a low concentration of glucose in the blood. You don't want to convert it, it into glycogen, the little bit that you have. Insu uh, so if you have a low concentration of glucose in the blood, insulin will cause the body to convert glycogen into glucose. Insulin doesn't do that. Glucagon does it. So the answer here is B. Question 26. The graph shows that the number of cases of MRSA in one country between 2001 and 2006. Between which years was the greatest change in the number of cases of MRSA seen? Was it 2002 to 2003? Well, the graph there isn't as steep as some of the other years. Was it 2003 to 2004? Well, certainly B is steeper than A. Was it 2004 to 2005? Not as steep as B. Was it 2005 to 2006? That is, That looks like it's a steeper gradient than in B. So this is A, B, C, and D. Looks like the answer here is D. And that one you can just tell by I. Just look to see which one looks steeper. Question 27. What are two adaptive features of a, of a human sperm cell? Okay, is a jelly coat present? No, a jelly coat is present in a human egg cell. Is there a relatively high number of mitochondria? Yes, it needs lots of energy to do its little, little journey as quickly as it possibly can. Is there an acrosome present? Yes, there is. And an acrosome is a little bit at the tip of the sperm cell that contains enzymes that break down the the jelly coat so that the egg can be fertilized. Are there relatively high energy stores? No, the egg has high energy stores. The sperm just produces energy quickly. It doesn't need to store it, it just needs to produce it. So two and three only. So the answer is C. Question 28. Which hormone maintains the thickness of the lining of the uterus during pregnancy? Okay, is it follicle stimulating hormone? No, that stimulates the follicle to develop, so it's not that one. Luteinizing hormone, uh, it stimulates ovulation. Estrogen, nope, that causes the that causes a few things, including the lining of the uterus to get thicker before pregnancy. And progesterone, yes, that's what maintains the lining of the uterus during pregnancy. Answer is D. Question 29. What is a possible disadvantage of in vitro fertilization, IVF? So disadvantage. So donated eggs and sperm can be used. No, that sounds to me like an advantage. Embryos can be screened for genetic, genetic disorders. No, that sounds like an advantage to me. It requires more medical resources. Well, it definitely is a lot more complicated than the natural method. Unused embryos can be stored. No, that sounds like an advantage to me. So it looks like the answer here is C. Question 30. A sperm cell from a domestic cat contains 19 chromosomes. If this cell fertilizes an egg, which zygote is produced? So a sperm cell has 19 chromosomes. That is a haploid number because sperm only has 19. Fertilize, a fertilized egg, a zygote, is a diploid cell. Okay, so it's not going to be a hap, uh, haploid, it's going to be diploid. And it's going to have 38 chromosomes because it's going to have twice the number of the haploid cell. Okay. Question 31. The diagram shows a cell of an organism. The nucleus contains 12 chromosomes. After it divides by mitosis, how many chromosome, chromosomes will be present in one of the daughter cells? Okay, the way that I always remember this is mitosis creates my toes and everything else in my body that's not a sperm or egg. And so that means meiosis creates the sperm or the egg. All right, so the diagram shows a cell of an organism. The nucleus contains 12 chromosomes. 
after it divides by mitosis, that means it has to end off with the same number of chromosomes it started out with. Because if you're creating your toes, you want exactly the same number of chromosomes at the end as the beginning. So that means the answer here has to be 12, because that's what it started out with. You want the same number of chromosomes at the end as what you started with. Your toes should have the same number of chromosomes as your nose. Question 32. Pure breeding black feathered chickens are mated with pure breeding white feathered chickens. All of the individuals in the offspring in the F1 generation have both black and white feathers. So when it says pure breeding, what they mean are homozygous. Okay, and said so all the individuals in the, of, in the offspring in the F1 generation have both black and white feathers. That means that the black and white feathered chickens, they're co-dominant alleles. They're both dominant. So they, they are both expressed if, if they have an allele from each. So that means for black feathered chickens, we could say B is for black feathered. And for white feathered chickens, capital W is for white because they're both dominant. Okay, so uh, all of the individuals in the, in the offspring in the F1 generation have both black and white, white feathers. So we have capital B by capital B, our little Punnett square here, by capital W by capital W, you'll have B, W, B, W, B, W, B, W. They'll all have both black and white feathers. So this is the F1 generation, okay? The offspring of the first, of the first uh, pair. What were the ratio of the offspring phenotypes when two of the F1 generation chickens are crossed? Well, as they all have the same genotype, we go, okay, so this for the F2 generation, we'll have capital B, capital W, a little square, capital B, capital W, B, B, w, no, B, W, B, W, and W, W. So we have, that is, this is black, this is, these, these two are black and white, and this is white. So one black, two black and white, and one white. That looks like the answer. The answer is B. Question 33. The diagram shows the bases on part of a chromosome, P, responsible for the production of normal hemoglobin. The same part of another chromosome, Q, is responsible for the projection of sickle cell hemoglobin. Okay, so chromosome P, G, A, G, chromosome Q, G, T, G. So the difference here is T and A. So obviously the, the complementary base is also different. What causes the difference between the two chromosomes? Is it discontinuous variation? No, discontinuous variation is that there's variation that uh, has, that's dependent on genes. It's not what causes the difference between the two chromosomes. Is it a gene mutation? Yep, looks like a gene mutation. The gene has mutated, so a T is in a place instead of an A. Phenotypic variation, that just means that there's a variation in the phenotype, which is what you see, and selective breeding, no, that's just choosing which organisms that are allowed to breed together. So the answer here is B. Question 34. Farmers have bred Holstein free gene cattle to produce more milk than older breeds of cattle. Which process was used to produce these cattle? Is it adaptation? Nope, that's just changes adaptations according to the environment. Genetic engineering? Nope, they didn't use genetic engineering. They didn't insert genes to, to do it. Natural selection? It wasn't natural selection. They did selective breeding. They allowed certain uh, cattle to breed with other cattle that had the desired characteristics. So the answer is D. Question 35. The diagram shows a food web. Okay, so we have rose plants, cabbage plants, caterpillars, green flies, beetles, robins, and hedgehogs. Which row shows a food chain in this food web? So first of all, we look at this and say producer. Which ones of these are producers? Is a hedgehog a producer? No, a hedgehog is not a producer. So A, it's not A. Is a cabbage plant a producer? Yep. A rose plant a producer? Yep, because they're both plants. Okay, so plants are producers. Now primary consumer. So rose plants are eaten by green flies. 
Cabbage plants are eaten by caterpillars or green flies. So green flies and caterpillars are the only primary consumers in this. So beetles are not, and, and hedgehogs are not primary consumers. So it looks like the answer is B, because green fly is a primary consumer. A green fly are eaten by beetles, the secondary consumer? Yep, the answer is B. There we go. Question 36. The diagram shows part of the nitrogen cycle. Which change is caused by the action of denitrifying bacteria? So denitrifying bacteria basically makes bacteria, uh, makes the nitrogen unusable to a plant. So basically it converts it into N2. Okay, and basically it goes into the air. That N2 is a form of nitrogen gas that's in the air and it's not usable by a plant. Okay, so it's denitrifying because it removes it from the nitrogen that can be used by the plant. So we th let's start with the plant. Plants dying and producing nitrates in the soil. No, that doesn't, uh, it does not denitrify. And plants being eaten by animals and then animals producing feces and urine that turn into nitrates in the soil. That's not removing it from the, from the, the ability to be used by plants because then they can be converted back into forms that can be used by the plant. Now, nitrogen gas in the air turning into nitrates in the soil. Nope, that cause that's nitrification. That's the opposite of denitrif de denitrifying. Okay, so D denitrifying is going from nitrates in the soil to nitrogen gas in the air. It makes it unusable to the plant. So question 37, the diagram shows an industrial fermenter used to produce penicillin. What is a function of the part labeled X? Okay, the part labeled X, that is a stirrer. It mixes. Okay, it agitates. All of those words can be used. So does it add oxygen to the solution? No, it doesn't add oxygen. It would just mix it around whatever is there. Does it maintain an even temperature throughout the solution? So it doesn't add oxygen. Yes, it actually would maintain an even temperature throughout the solution because uh, if you didn't mix it up, you would get warmer sections and colder sections depending on where is being heated. So, but the more you, if you mix it, then it's going to spread the, the heat throughout the solution. Does it record the pH? No, nope, there's nothing to record, nothing used to record there. It just stirs. Does it sterilize? Nope, it just stirs. So the answer here is B. Question 38. Genetic engineering involves various stages. What is the correct sequence for genetic engineering? Well, first of all, you have your plasmid, your circular section of DNA. Then you have your human DNA. I'm just going to draw one strand of it. And the first thing you do is you cut both the, the plasmid and the human DNA with the same restriction enzyme, the same enzyme. Use the same set of scissors, which is the restriction enzyme. Okay, so you want to cut out this piece of human DNA. You want to break open the plasmid and it doesn't really matter which one you do first because you're just cutting both of them. So restriction enzyme cuts human DNA and restriction enzyme cuts bacterial plasma DNA. That either of those could be one. Both of those could be one, but obviously only one of them is. So four or three is the option here. Okay, the next thing, once you've cut those two, then recombinant plasma is inserted into bacteria or human DNA is inserted into bacterial plasma DNA. Okay, so recombinant plasma is means that they've already inserted the human DNA into the bacterial DNA. So that means one has to be the next step. So this is three. Okay, so that means four is one, three is two, then one is three, and then the recombinant plasmid is inserted bacteria into the bacteria, that is four. And then finally, the bacteria can create the human gene so you can do what needs to happen. You can get what you need to get. So the answer here is D. Question 39. The statements describe some of the events that occur during eutrophication. What is directly responsible for the increase in bacteria? Okay, directly responsible, not indirectly. So a decrease in dissolved oxygen concentration. Nope, that isn't that doesn't cause more bacteria to occur. Bacteria use oxygen for aerobic respiration. They can do anaerobic respiration as well, but 
Decreasing the dissolved oxygen doesn't increase the number of bacteria. An increase in the nitrate concentration. Well, the nitrates actually cause an increase in the algae, the plants, because they're the ones that take in the nitrates. An increase in the population of the algae. Well, the increase in the population of the algae on their own doesn't increase the amount of bacteria. What does is when those algae die and settle to the bottom, so an increase in the death of the producers, which are the algae, so the bacteria break down the producers that have died, the algae that's died. So the answer here is D. Question 40. In 1991, there were only 14 Davisia chondridin plants. I have no idea what Davisia, Davisia chondridin plants look like, What? but it's okay. There are only 14 of them. It's okay if you don't know. What happens to a plant population that becomes very small? So each plant will produce fewer offspring. Well, if they have access to the proper number of gametes, if they're being fertilized, then they will produce the same number of offspring as if there is a large number per, per plant. Each plant will produce more offspring. No, it's going to produce the same number per plant. Variation in the population is increased. No, they need more plants to produce more variation. So variation in the population is reduced. Yes. If there's not that many to choose from, not that many alleles to choose from, there's not going to be much variation. So the answer is D. And that is the last question on this exam. I hope you found it useful and you'll do very well on your final exams. If you've liked it, please press the thumbs up button. button. We'd, we'd appreciate it. We'd also appreciate it if you'd subscribe if you haven't already. If you have anything you'd like to say to us, please write them in the discussion section below. And have a great day.